It's not just a matter of, well, one's easier to read or one's worded a little bit different so you can understand it better. They are completely and totally different books. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You just didn't wake up one morning and decide, gosh, you know, I think we'll, we'll start a controversy here. Uh, let's see, what can we be controversial about? I know. We'll pick a Bible, we'll make it the only Bible, and we'll fuss with everybody that doesn't. Uh, let's see, King James Bible sounds good. Let's do that. That's not why we believe the King James Bible. We are not without our reasons. And we have some very good reasons for believing that the King James Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice for the English-speaking people until Jesus Christ comes back. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know, it's interesting, Satan's strategy always has been one of creating doubt. Yea, hath God said. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? There's no doubt the manuscript tradition is overwhelming and vast that John did not write these words. I, un I understand that, that you know, that's what you, if you, that's what you've heard God speaking in, then something other than that sounds lesser and you're, you're changing stuff. But if you just recognize the need to have a historical perspective. Which Bible version is best for you? Short answer, the right tool for the right job. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing that the devil ever questioned was what God said. He did not question the virgin birth. He did not question the fundamentals of the faith. He didn't say which church is the church Christ founded. He said, did God say it? Question. Satan's attack is on what God said, and this book professed to be what God said. Nothing more than a revision of what God just said. And from that day till this day, Satan does not come with his words. He comes with a revision of God's words. The first thing the devil try to keep you from doing is hearing that book. That's the first thing he'll do. Now, if you listen to it, then he'll work on you to get you to, to misunderstand it. But if you understand it, he'll work on to make you forget it. But if you remember it, he'll work on you to get you to disobey it. Every attack he makes is against that book. And the question is, is that book what God said or is it not? For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Dr. Heiser talking about the King James Bible, and he actually has authority in this, authority in this, authority in this, because of his job, the King James Virgin, and here's what he had to say. Translation is a, is a very human process, is a very human process, is a very human process that is dependent on the manuscript data at your disposal at any given point.
fact, when you really get down to it, it's the same thing as Roman Catholicism. These guys are little Baptist or Protestant or Presbyterian popes, whatever they happen to be, and they, because of their excellent knowledge of the original languages, will go to the lexicon and sort through 30 different major editions of the Greek New Testament and tell us on any given day what the Word of God should be. But then again, depending on how breakfast is digesting, it may be one thing today and something else tomorrow. Do you see the shifting sands they're on? I'll tell you something right now. I'm glad that God has given me a book. And I'll tell you what right now, too, that I'm sure that I'm not going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and God's going to say to me, DeMichael, how come you told the people in your church they had the Bible? Why didn't you tell them that they needed to know the lexicon and know a whole library's worth of material and study it out and never quite be sure if they had thus saith the Lord? It behooves us tonight, since we are inundated with countless Bible translations to make certain that what we have in our hand is the Word of God. If God inspired the Word, there is no purpose whatsoever in inspiring it if you don't preserve it. How many of you believe that God has saved your soul? Let me, let me see. When he saved you, now don't put your hand on yet. Keep your hand up unless when he saved you, he didn't make you pure by taking all your sins away. Okay, now, having done that, who is going to keep you pure forever? Yeah, but what about all the sinful men that cross your path? What about all the sinful things that come your way? You say, oh, praise the Lord. He's going to keep me no matter what man might do. He's going to keep me no matter what I might do. Well, if he'd do that for you, you're not near as important as his word. Surely if he's going to keep a soul that he has saved, he is going to keep the book that he has authored. John chapter 8, verse 47, Christ speaking. He that is of God heareth God's word or words. Plural. You therefore hear them not because you're not a God. Well, I better have them, I guess. Because he that is of God heareth God's words. Have I got them? Well, I do or I don't. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven earth shall pass away, but my W, O, R, D, S shall not pass away. Have you got them? Well, you got them or you don't. I'm reading the New Testament. It's written in Greek. Is that Greek word you got in your lap in front of you? Well, you must have lost his word then somewhere. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee? And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. In 55 A.D., the twisting already begins. Second Peter 2 deals with that. You can just put it in your notes. In the interest of time, we'll keep moving here. One of the things that starts happening is that the Greek philosophy and concepts are starting to be Im embedded in the attitudes and, uh, of the, uh, the people at that time. And so they're beginning to disparage the existing writings of both the Old Testament and the New. And... Uh, one of the centers for these kinds of this introduction of Greek thought was, of course, Alexandria. And uh, the Gnostics, as they're called, they call themselves, uh, implying that they know and you don't, their knowledge was kept sort of secret. You had to be part of the in group to really know what they're dealing with here. They had an attitude that all material is evil, and uh, they tried to distance themselves from the material universe and so on. 
and thus Christ was not really God in the flesh. Jesus was really just a phantom, uh, only had the appearance of being there. He didn't leave footprints in the sand, and they had all these crazy ideas that came. Gnosticism is actually a collection of all kinds of bizarre ideas. It's not a unified presentation, but much of it, it's a, it was a strange mix of what you and I would consider a new age and, the, and also the Greek philosophies mixed in with the appearance of Christianity. And this was ba- gaining momentum even before John died because his letter, his first epistle of John, uh, deals with this in several places. One of the things the Gnostics did is they expurgated the scriptures. They, they, they would delete things from the scriptures. They were known for mutilating the scriptures. In 156 AD, Irenaeus said of the Gnostics, quote, Wherefore they and their followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the scriptures, which they themselves have shortened. In other words, I want you to be aware of the fact that one of the practices of the Gnostics was to delete portions of the scripture. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. This is mind-blowing what I'm going to show you next. But before we do that, look at this. The word of God, small w, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a, listen, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, somehow this book discerns the thoughts and intents of you. This is a supernatural book. Somebody has said this, the Bible reads you while you read it. Look at the next verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in its sight. Is that what it said? That's not what it said. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Do you know what's just happened there? Verse 13, that's given the book, the scriptures, a personality. It says his, not it. That's mind-blowing. Now, if you now listen, if you think that's a mistake, you have suddenly jumped out of the camp of the Bible believers and gone to the Bible correctors. You're a Bible believer or you're a Bible corrector, even though you are a Christian, and not every Christian is a Bible believer. You need to understand that. Now, either you have a final authority like the Lord Jesus Christ had, like Paul had, like David had, or you don't. And if you don't have a final authority and you're not a Bible believer, you may say you are, but when you're pushed into a corner, you become a Bible corrector. If you think that you have a, you know, if you think that you have a book in front of you on your lap, on your table, your desk, whatever, and you think that book has got errors in it, then you are a Bible corrector. And you have set yourself above God. God says he's given you the Bible, but you think there's mistakes in it. Therefore, you become the final authority. And if you become the final authority, what does that make you? Turn to Galatians, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Know ye therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Isn't that interesting? And the scripture foreseeing. The scripture foreseeing. There were no scriptures then when God spoke to Abraham. Genesis hadn't been written. Moses wrote Genesis about 1500 BC. While Abraham lived around 1900 BC. Do you know what that's that's changed words like from God to scripture? wild. Do you see that? That's wild. The scriptures weren't even around then. Now look at Romans 9.17. Turn there. Romans 9.17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, 
Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. The scripture saith what? Saith unto Pharaoh? Saith the scripture? Saith unto him. There were no scriptures around when Moses taught with Pharaoh. Something wild is happening here. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If there be any mistakes in the Bible, there may as well be a thousand. If there be one falsehood, just one falsehood in that book, it did not come from the God of truth. Inspiration is far harder to believe in than preservation. Why can't God preserve his word for us, perfect for today? And if he hasn't done, he's not much of a God. If he can create the world out of nothing, but he can't give us a perfect book, that's madness. Yet most Christians believe that. The creation, was it too hard for God? No. Was the worldwide flood too hard for God? Oh, but it was a local flood. <laughs> Was the parting of the Red Sea too hard for God? Is preserving the words of those writers too hard for God? Is giving us a perfect Bible for today too hard for God that is 100% perfect? Oh, oh yeah, well, he, he can do everything, but he just can't quite give us that book. Ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, you have a blank sheet of paper and God tells you what to write down like he did with Paul and David and Solomon and they write down, they're inspired to write down, God inspires them to write and they write it down. Then why wouldn't God preserve it? Most people won't be too concerned with religion, they will realize that they don't need it. In order to do this the Bible will be changed it will be rewritten to fit the new religion gradually key words will be replaced with with new words having various shades of meaning then the meaning attached to the new word uh, can be close to the old word and as time goes on other shades of meaning of that word can be emphasized and then gradually that word replaced with another word um, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that uh, everything in Scripture need not be rewritten, just key words replaced by other words, and uh, the variability in meaning attached to any word can be uh, used as a uh, tool to change the entire meaning of Scripture and therefore make it acceptable to this uh, new religion. Most people won't know the difference, and this is another one of the times where he said, the few who do notice the difference won't be enough to matter. Then followed one of the most surprising statements of the whole presentation. He said, some of you probably think the churches won't stand for this. And he went on to say, the churches will help us. There is no elaboration on this. Uh, it was unclear just uh, what he had in mind when he said the churches will help us. In retrospect, I think uh, some of us now can understand what he might have been at that time. If there be one falsehood, just one falsehood in that book, it did not come from the God of truth. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. The words of the Lord are pure words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Children, 
How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? And his truth endureth to all generations. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the nation in the side of the Lord. I will be like the most high. They took that verse out of the Bible, which now teaches you that all you have to do is be baptized and you're okay. All things were created by him and for him. I just think the modern Bibles are easier to read. You know who says that? People who don't read any of them. They removed the these, thous, and yees and everything and replaced it with the word you. Now there's a big problem with replacing thee, thou, thy, thine, and ye with a simple generic you. And here's the problem. The word you can be singular, talking about one person, or the word you can be plural, talking about a lot of people. If I walk into a room and say, you come with me, does that mean one of you or all of you? You can't tell. The King James translators were aware of that, and they did not want to have to leave the Bible up for you to try to figure out what it meant. So in order to make the Bible easy to understand, they brought in thee, thou, thy, and thine, the T words, for singular use of the word you. Talking to one person, about one person, they would use a T word, thee, thou, thy, and thine. For the plural use of the word you, talking about a group of people, they would use a Y word, you, your, or ye. That makes the Bible, the King James Bible, easier to read and easier to understand. The new Bibles destroy verses by simply using the generic you. You can see in John chapter 3 very clearly, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye must be born again. He changed it to plural. I'm telling you that everybody must be born again. That's a really important distinction. The fact is, it's very precise in the King James. For the last hundred years, we have been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What's wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it, because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, 
Behold, I send my messenger before your face will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. How many Bibles do you got to say prophets? Let me see your hand. Prophets? Why, of course. You know why it says prophets? There are two quotations. Isaiah did not say verse 2. You know who said verse 2? Who, folks? Malachi. Why do you say Isaiah spoke it? Did God lie in the original manuscripts? How come he thought Isaiah said it? And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And we, we point to sinners and we say, It's not your religion, it's not your works, it's not your baptism, it's not your good deeds, it's not anything you've done. If you'll call on the name of the Lord, He'll save you. Guess which word of Luke 23, 42 is not in the modern Bibles? Lord. In the modern Bibles, the dying thief got to paradise without calling on the name of the Lord. Now, why would somebody mess with that? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Genesis 22, left hand side, King James. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. The NIV tells Abraham to go ahead and sacrifice him there. The King James simply says, offer him up. The NIV says, sacrifice him there. Two different ideas, aren't they? This is very, very important, the exact wording of this verse. And we see the, we see the severity of it because the NIV is actually telling you that Abraham disobeyed God or that God changed his word. Because if you believe that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, he is ordered by God to plunge that knife into his chest, isn't he? For the love of money is the root of all evil. In this one, you know neither the day nor the hour of when the ice cream man will come along or whatever. But in this one, it's important wherein the Son of Man cometh. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him... Did you know they messed with this one? They dropped the begotten the doctrine of the begotten Son of God. And what am I saying there when I say begotten Son of God? That means that He literally is from God the Father. And when you take that out, then Jesus can simply be the created one who became the Son of God. Notice Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is the King James. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Notice this. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That teaches the doctrine of the eternality of Jesus Christ. He didn't just pop up on the scene one day. He always was, is, and shall be. That's what the King James said. The NIV says, whose origins are from old. It says that Jesus had a beginning. Now, do you see that? 
He was God manifest in the flesh because he's not only a baby in a manger, but from everlasting, he's been God. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. For thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. John 1.18 The only begotten God. That's the Amplified Bible. There are those today who meet for Mass and they call Mary the Mother of God. Begotten God goes directly with that idea that Mary is the Mother of God. That means that God was born. For as much as Christ has suffered for us, the for us is deleted. If there be one falsehood, just one falsehood in that book, it did not come from the God of truth. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. There's the greatest verse in the Bible in the Incarnation. He was revealed in the flesh. Don't you have the word God in there? There's no God in this Bible. I said there's no God in this Bible. God ain't in this Bible. You say, he who, the antecedent of heat, he who would be the mystery of godliness. And the mystery of godliness is neuter, and he who is masculine. If you want to start messing with the Greek. Who killed Goliath? Who killed Goliath? David killed Goliath. 2 Samuel 21 says, Elhanan, the son of no, his dad, uh, slew the brother of Goliath. There's New American Standard. Elhanan, the son of the same guy, killed Goliath. This is an error. Deuteronomy 23, 17, the King James says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor sodomite of the sons of Israel. That's what God said. The NIV says, no Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. They took it out. Notice the next one. And there were also sodomites in the land. And they were an abomination, right? Notice what the NIV says. There were even male shrine prostitutes. Took that out. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. That deals with the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark. Now, if you look in the NIV, you might find it there. But here's what they do. They put a line across the page after verse 8, and they say, the most reliable and early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. What they're telling you is, you have our permission to not believe all of these verses should be in the Bible. Out of 620 manuscripts that contain Mark's Gospel. 618 of them have those verses. That's all 600 minuscules, that's lowercase letters. All 15 unsealed, that's uppercase letters. And three of the five codices, you know, big books. Only two of the 620 leave out those verses, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. And both of them were only made public in the decade before Westcott Hort and the others started the move to completely change the Bible. When you get Jeremiah chapter 23 and pick up about verse 36, you find somebody's mess with that book. It says, For ye have perverted, for ye have perverted the word of the living God. That's a charge brought against somebody. That says, Somebody perverted the words. Now, somebody perverted the words of the living God. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. And somebody took those living words from the living God and perverted those words. In 
hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Is Jesus a liar? RSV, go to the feast yourselves. I'm not going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. Here Jesus says, I'm not going, but he went. King James Version. Here Jesus says, I'm not yet going, and then he went. So here he's telling the truth and there's a liar. The Bible says in Matthew 7 that narrow is the way. Straight is the gate and narrow the way that leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. Revised Standard says the gate is narrow and the way is hard. Wait, is it hard to go to heaven or just not many do it? Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I want to ask you about three questions. The first one is, do you have the scripture? And number two, the scriptures you have, are they inspired? And number three, do you actually know what God said? And I don't mean the King James translators. I mean God. The one that saved you. Do you know what he said? Alright, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. All scriptures give the inspiration of God. He says it's given by inspiration. The question is, do you have scripture that is given inspiration? Let's see if Timothy did. Verse 15, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. Timothy had the Scriptures, knew them. Timothy had the Scriptures, and all Scriptures given the inspiration to God. Oh, I turn to Acts chapter 8. Now here's the Ethiopian eunuch going down to the Gaza the desert, and Philip gets in the chariot with him. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip begins to talk with him. When he gets up into the uh, chariot with him, we read this. Acts chapter 8, verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. 35. Philip opened his mouth and began to the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. Did the Ethiopian have the scripture? How many of you say yes? Let me see your hands. Is all scripture given inspiration of God? How many say yes? All scripture is given inspiration to God. The verse said he had the scripture. Therefore, what he had was given inspiration to God. If you believe what you just read. All right, turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately set away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who came thither, went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Did they have the scriptures? Why should they have search them? Is all scripture given inspiration of God? That what they had was given inspiration of God. Do you have it? If you have it, then what you have is given inspiration of God. If you don't, then you don't. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now right, let's turn to the Old Testament. What is this inspiration? The Bereans have the scripture, Christ have the scripture, Paul have the scripture, the Ethiopian eunuch have the scripture, do you have the scripture? The term inspiration occurs one of the time in the Bible and none of the scholars know where it occurs. So I'll show you. Job chapter 32 verse 7. I said they should speak in multitude of years, should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Chapter 33 verse 3. Job 33 3. My word shall be of the uprightness of my heart. My lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me. Watch it and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. 
That word in the New Testament for inspiration in Greek is theopneustia, which means God breathed. And those fellows of the Spirit of God made me, and the breath of God gave me life. God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. And not till God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. All right, if all scripture is given inspiration and all scripture has the breath of God on it, God has breathed into it. That makes it alive. Do you have the scriptures? If you have the scriptures, they're given inspiration. If they're given inspiration, they're alive. The word of God that liveth and abideth forever. If you don't have the scriptures, you have a dead book. If you don't have the scriptures, you have a book in which there is no life because the breath of God is not on it. I'm teaching you from scriptures what the scriptures say about the scriptures. I'm not telling what any scholar believes. I couldn't care less what they believe or you believe. Or your friends, or the people that teach you, or the people that taught them. What say of the scriptures? Somebody's always saying the church fathers, some of the church fathers ought to have been called the church babies. What say of the scripture? Somebody said the historic position, the blazes with the historic position. What say of the scripture? Ezekiel 37. Here's the valley of dry bones. 37.3. Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Lord, thou knowest. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones. Behold. I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will sinews upon you, and bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Verse 8. And when I beheld, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. Verse 14, I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. Inspiration means that God breathes on writing scripture, and when he breathes upon them, they become alive. The question is, do you have the scriptures? Number two, do the scriptures you have, are they inspired? Curtis Hudson says, absolutely not. John R. Rice said, absolutely not. Bob Jones III says, absolutely not. James Combs of BBC said, absolutely not. Richard Heimer, Jr. of California says, absolutely not. The standard teaching of every Christian school in the country is, you don't have them. The teaching is, only the original autographs are inspired. Which means, you have a dead book. I wonder how I got saved from a dead book. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word of God cannot work effectively in you unless you believe it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again. How many of you are born again? Let me see your hands. Okay. Not of corruptible seed, that's your daddy's seed, but of incorruptible seed. What is it? By the word of God that liveth, got breath in it, that liveth and abideth forever. And here's the teaching. The teaching is only the original manuscripts are inspired. Somewhere back here are what we call the original autographs, which means the original writer wrote it for the first time. All Christian colleges and schools and universities in America, the major ones, teach that the Bible is inspired in the original autographs, which means if you had the original Greek manuscripts, you would have the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. But since nobody has the original autographs, nobody has the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. Because the autographs are gone. We believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, inerrant, infallible Word of God in the original autographs. That's the statement. 
Now, there are about 30 things wrong with that. Here's the first thing wrong. It's that word for Bible. That's Biblos. That word means book. Not manuscripts. A book. If you say you believe the Bible is the Word of God, you know what you're saying? You're saying, I believe a book is the Word of God, not manuscripts. The word Biblia Bible doesn't mean manuscripts. It means a book. So these fellows say, we believe the Bible, the book, is verbally inspired through original autographs. Hey man, there never has been a book that had original autographs in it. Somebody is out of their skull. Now look at here. Moses wrote some original autographs in 1500 B.C. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. David wrote some original autographs, Psalms, in 1000 and around that time B.C. When David wrote his original autographs and put them in the Bible, the Bible was what Moses had written, what Joshua had written, and what the writers of Ruth and Judges and 1 Samuel had written. And when David wrote his writings, you couldn't have found an original of Moses if you looked all day and all night. The original autographs were never in one book. Why, by the time Matthew wrote his gospel, you couldn't have found an original of the Psalms, or original Isaiah, or original Malachi, if you looked all day and all night. In Acts chapter 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the copy of the prophet Isaiah, is there anybody here dumb enough to think that Ethiopian eunuch had the original copy of Isaiah in that chariot? How could he have done that? It was in the synagogue at Capernaum. Luke chapter 4. When Christ went into the synagogue at Capernaum, Luke 4, he opened and read at the prophet Isaiah. Did he have the original? If he did, the Ethiopian didn't have it. There never has been on this earth any book that contained original autographs. That stuff is nonsense. Christ had the scripture. The ones he had were copies of copies of copies of copies. Some people think he didn't have a copy. Some people think he had a translation. Lesson number one. You don't have to have the original autographs to have the scripture. Now, folks, have you got that? You want to get that. Number two, if you have the scriptures, you have something that God gave by inspiration. Now, the question is, do you have what God said? My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with it. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Out of John chapter 8, verse 45, Christ speaking, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convince me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Now look out. He that is of God heareth God's fundamentals. No. He that is of God heareth God's what, folks? What? Yeah, and I don't mean the Word of God either. Words. The fundamentals. The fundamentals is your foot. When, when the devil came to Eve, he didn't question the virgin birth. He didn't question the deity of Christ. He questioned what God said. All right, come across here and pick up John chapter 14. I don't mean the principles. John chapter 14, then. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak, not the principles, not the fundamentals, not the teachings, the words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, and he doeth the works. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and shall be done unto you. Do you have God's words? 
Never mind all this pious talk about the Word of God, the Bible is the Word of God. We have to, never mind all that stuff. Have you got the words that God spoke? Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord. I will send a famine in the land, not of the famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words. And I don't mean the word. What does the Bible actually say? You can interpret this book to make out whatever you think it makes out. There's loads of Bible interpretations. So we're not really interested in what you think it means. I'm interested in what it actually says. There's a difference. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? You see, there's over 200 versions of the Bible and they all say different things. There's verses missed out. There's 64,000 changes from the NIV to the AV. Thousands of changes from the New King James to the Authorised Version Bible. Every word of God is pure. You hear that? Every word of God is pure. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed is the word of God. We have the incorruptible seed. If something is incorruptible, it cannot perish. So therefore, this book is incorruptible. It liveth and it abideth forever. That's what the Bible says about itself. That's not my opinion. That's what this book says. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Look in John chapter number 12. And he says in verse number 46, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know, you know what the final authority is? For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now Philippians 2 said, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that he is Lord, the glory of God the Father. And yet, and yet... There is something in this universe that God himself has said stands even higher than his name. It's God's Word.
And no matter how Jesus feels toward you in that day of judgment, if you have not trusted Him as your personal Savior, you must be sentenced to an eternity of suffering and torment because that's what the Word says and the Word is the final authority.